In this video, we're going to talk about the basics of cancer. Let me start out with a few drawings. First of all, what is cancer? Cancer is uncontrolled growth. Uncontrolled growth, when I talk about growth, I'm talking about what term? And you use this term in lab, and it starts with an M. When a cell grows or a cell reproduces, what is that called? It's called mitosis. So what happens in cancer is that you have uncontrolled growth or uncontrolled mitosis. What happens is the cells go through hyperplasia. And what we're going to talk about is what causes this to happen and what happens. So normally in a healthy cell, a healthy cell is going to reproduce. Most of them are. Most of those cells are going to reproduce. And there are genes that control when a cell goes through mitosis and when a cell stops going through mitosis. Now a healthy gene that's doing what it should be in terms of mitosis is called a proto-oncogene. So even though you see this prefix onco, you might know that means cancer. But a proto-oncogene is a healthy gene. It's a healthy gene. So what happens when a proto-oncogene is activated, it will stimulate a cell to go through mitosis. So in terms of, I'm going to use the example of a stoplight. A proto-oncogene is like the green light of the cell. When the pro proto-oncogene is activated, it forms a, through transcription and translation, a protein that will stimulate that cell to go through mitosis. So it is a normal healthy gene that is active in any cell that goes through mitosis. Now you also have another type of gene, and this is a healthy normal gene, they're called tumor suppressor genes. And there's actually two types of these. One type I call a yellow light gene, the other type I call a red light gene. In a tumor suppressor gene, what happens is, when the cell goes through mitosis, a tumor suppressor gene will then turn mitosis off. It transcribes and translates to a protein that will turn mitosis off. That's a red light version. But there's also what I call a yellow light version of a tumor suppressor gene. So here's what happens. When a cell goes through mitosis and you're replicating that DNA and, and getting two cells, a lot of times something can happen and you can get a mutation. So you have these two cells. That one cell's gone through mitosis. You have two cells. And let's say something happened in that process and one of the cells is mutated. What do we need to do to that cell that's mutated? We need to get rid of it. So what's going to happen is you're going to have these yellow light genes that are going to check the two new cells. And if something is wrong with one of the two new cells, that gene is going to make a protein that's going to destroy the cell. An example of that, a common example, is called the p53 gene. Now apoptosis is just the technical word for that destruction of the cell. So what's going to happen is if the p53 gene finds the protein, of the P, from the p53 gene finds that something's gone wrong, it's going to promote the destruction of that cell. So this gene's really important. It's again active in cells that go through mitosis. It's checking for any mistakes. So again, we have green light genes that turn mitosis on. We have red light genes that turn mitosis off. And we have yellow light genes that check, that check to make sure that the two cells that were formed for mitosis are OK. So what happens in the case of cancer? Well, something goes wrong here. These genes are mutated. Okay? These genes are mutated. So if a proto-oncogene is mutated, then a cell might, this proto-oncogene might just stay on and the cell continues to go through mitosis. If a tumor suppressor gene is mutated, there's no red light and the cell may continue through mitosis. But a very common cause of cancer is a mutation of the yellow light gene. So what you have happen is a cell goes through mitosis like it's supposed to, but something happened to one of those cells. But there's no longer a protein to check the bad cell and to destroy it. So what happens is that bad cell survives and then continues to go through mitosis, continues to get more mutations, and then you get the development of cancer. Now I've simplified this. It doesn't take usually just one mutation to develop cancer. Scientists believe it takes anywhere from three to five mutations in these genes in order to get a cancerous tumor to start to form. Some cancers we know exactly what mutations occur and other cancers we do not. I will tell you though that about 50 percent of cancers the p53 gene is involved there. Skin cancer is a very common type of cancer where we see commonly see the p53 gene mutated. Now what causes the mutation of these genes? What causes the mutation of these genes are called carcinogens. 
Okay, let me write that here. Carcinogens cause mutations. Now, what are examples of carcinogens? Smoking is a carcinogen. UV light is a carcinogen. Um, even things like they used to make old M&Ms that were red, and that red food dye was found to be carcinogenic in rats. And so there was a time in history, and it was a sad time, where there were no red M&Ms. Now, there are red M&Ms now, and they are made of a different food coloring that is not known to be carcinogenic. So burnt food is a known carcinogen, at least in rats. Nutrasweet, is, there's been some research showing that in rats that have large doses of Nutrasweet, that they get the development of cancer. Okay. Now, when a proto-oncogene or a tumor suppressor gene is mutated, we call it an oncogene. Okay, we call it an oncogene. So it's a mutated proto-oncogene. So when a gene is mutated that deals with mitosis is mutated, we call it an oncogene. Okay, we call it an oncogene. Now, what is the difference between a cancer cell and a normal cell? Let's go through a list here, and again, you need to take some notes on the differences. First thing is, a normal cell, okay, in a normal cell you have controlled growth, so you have controlled mitosis. You have mitosis is turned on, mitosis is turned off, and the cells are checked for anything that's abnormal. What you see in cancer cells is the opposite. Because of the mutations in these genes, these cells are going to go through uncontrolled mitosis. And if you look at this bundle of cells here, you see a bunch of cells going through mitosis. Normal cells have contact inhibition. What contact inhibition means is that they're not going to move around a lot as long as they are close to other cells. So this cell here, as long as it has contact with other cells, it's happy. It doesn't move, it doesn't grow as much, it's happy just being there. Cancer cells, on the other hand, I always say they like to dance. So when a normal cell hears a song that it likes, it wants to dance but it doesn't. It stays where it is and it just does its normal job. But when a cancer cell hears a song that it likes, it starts to move. Okay, it starts to move. So imagine if you've got a cancer cell and it starts to move. It's not happy just staying where it is. What it can do is it can dance, it can get into the bloodstream, and it can travel to other locations in the body. And when it gets to those other locations, then it continues to go through uncontrolled growth. So when you hear the word metastasize, which I'll show you in a little bit, when a, when a cancer has metastasized, that means a cell has left the original area and gone to another place in the body and then continues to go through mitosis. So it lacks contact inhibition. It wants to move. Okay? It wants to dance. Normal cells are also in a nice organized layer. And if you look at these cells, they're nice and organized the way they should be. If you look at here, at this group of cells, they're not organized. They're not lined up in a nice, neat formation. They're forming what we call a tumor. The other difference is normal cells are what we call differentiated. And what that means is that these cells are doing whatever their DNA instructions are telling them to do. If they're a pancreas cell, they're doing pancreas things. If they're skin cells, they're doing skin things. They're doing their job. What happens to a cancer cell is it becomes non-differentiated. So what you start to see happen is you start to get this clump of cells in an area let's say in the lungs. And not only are these cells dancing or moving around and growing uncontrollably and taking over the other cells of the organ, they're also not doing their job. So they're, let's say it's lung cancer. They're replicating really quickly and they're taking over the healthy lung cells plus they're not doing lung things. So the lungs cannot do their function properly with a large amount of cancer cells. And then the last thing is, and this is pretty common sense, is you have normal nuclei in normal cells and you have abnormal nuclei due to mutations and uncontrolled mitosis in cancer cells. So make sure you understand the difference between normal cells and cancer cells. Now, basics of treatments. The basic treatments. Before we do that, let's talk about different terminology for cancer cells. Let me give you some terms over here. Actually, let me change colors, make it a little bit easier. One of the things they have to know about cancer is, first of all, whether it is cancer or not, it can be a benign tumor. And the next thing they need to know is whether the tumor is actually left and metastasized. So if you have a biopsy done, if they get an opportunity to do a biopsy, they're going to look at those cells. They're first going to determine whether it is cancer or whether it is benign. 
benign is not a cancerous tumor. In women with breast tumors, about 80% of them are benign. Now, because you have a benign tumor, that's a good thing. That means it's not dancing, it's not going through real uncontrolled replication, it's not going to leave the original tumor. But when you have a higher number of benign tumors, you have an increased risk of developing malignant tumors. So a good example of that is moles on your skin. And moles and freckles are the same thing. So if you have a lot of moles on you, like I do, they're benign. But I have an increased risk of skin cancer because I have so many moles. Because moles are a sign of damage underneath the skin, at the lower layer of the skin, of cells that are going through mitosis. So if you find out that the cancer is malignant, what that means is it's cancerous, okay, it's cancerous, and it also means that it has the ability to move around the body. It has the ability to what we call metastasize. And that metastasis, okay, metastasis means that it has left the original tumor. Okay, it's left the original tumor. Now if you catch a malignant tumor, if you catch it before it's metastasized, it's much easier to treat. But if a tumor has metastasized, like you hear about someone that has lung cancer, but the cancer's gone to their brain, then it's harder to treat because now we don't just have to treat the tumor, we have to treat the whole body because those cells from that cancer can be anywhere in the body, places that we can't even see with an MRI or a CAT scan. So a, a biopsy in many times will tell you whether a, a tumor is benign, whether it's malignant. Now it won't necessarily tell you whether it has metastasized or not. So we figure out what kind of tumor we have and what we're trying to deal with. Now they can do surgery. They can go in and they can take a benign tumor out or they can take a malignant tumor out. The thing you have to be careful of is you have a tumor, if you have a tumor and here's the tumor and here's the healthy cells around it, you have to make sure when you take that tumor out that you take every cancerous cell out. So for example, if this was a mole, what they'll do with a mole, this next line is going to be an incision. It's going to try to be an incision. Okay. They're going to have to take every single cancer cell out. So what they'll do is they'll take the tumor out. If it's a mole, what they'll do is they'll look at the edges of what they've taken out. If the cells on the edge of what they've taken out are normal, then they know they've, there's a good chance they've gotten all the cancer cells out. If they do, let's say they just cut here instead. If they look at the edges, they'll still see abnormal cancer cells, and then they need to go in and they need to take more of it out. So whenever you do surgery to take out a tumor, in most cases you have to try to take out the whole thing. Now in the skin, this isn't as big a deal. I'll tell you, they can do some pretty big incisions to make sure they get the whole thing out. But when you have brain cancer, you can't just go in and say, okay, we're going to take out half the brain to make sure we got all the cancer cells out. So depending on where the cancer is in the body determines whether they can do surgery or not. Now I'll tell you, there's been a slight change in the order that they do some of these. Um, what they do, what chemotherapy is, and it used to be, not for all cancers, but for many, that they would do surgery first and try to remove the tumor, and then they would do chemotherapy. What chemotherapy is, is this. Cancer cells are really hungry cells. They're going through a lot of mitosis and they want a lot of nutrients. So what chemotherapy does is it provides poisonous nutrients to cancer cells. So the hope is, is that the cancer cells will take up the poisonous nutrients and that it will kill them. Okay. The problem is, and the side effects you get from chemotherapy happen because there are cells in your body that go through mitosis a lot. Skin cells go through mitosis a lot. Hair cells are just modified skin cells. The cells within your digestive system go through mitosis a lot. So where we get a lot of the side effects of chemotherapy is because those cells, those healthy cells, are taking up this poisonous food and it's destroying them also. Now different chemotherapies are different. Some cause you to lose your hair, some do not. I've known cases where people are doing the same chemotherapy treatments, one loses their hair and one does not. So again, it's going to differ from person to person. Another side effect you see is that the person's very tired, and that's because you're basically putting poison in their body. They also don't want to eat a lot, or they have trouble eating or keeping food down. That's primarily because one of the things your body does is it says, hey, if you're putting poison in me, 
I'm going to try to get rid of that poison. And so you, they can throw up a lot. And also because those digestive system cells are taking in the poison and are affected by it, people tend not to be very hungry and they have trouble keeping food down. One of the, if you've followed the news at all, they've talked about the legalization of marijuana and one of the uses it can be used for is helping people that are going through chemotherapy. One of the things marijuana does is it gives people the munchies and so it helps stimulate their appetite so they're more likely to eat and keep up their strength. Chemotherapy, you need to understand, wears down the body. Okay, it wears down the body. And so over time, it can become toxic. In some cases, the chemotherapy can kill a person before the cancer actually would. Radiation treatment. Radiation treatment is used when you have a localized tumor. So we're not going to radiate the whole body because radiation, radiation will actually kill cells. In this case, though, we want it to kill the cancer cells. So radiation is used when you have a tumor in a specific spot and you want to beam it with radiation and hopefully destroy those cancer cells without killing the cells around it. So radiation can be used if you have a localized area. Now there's a lot of different treatments out there that are coming up um, that have positive effects. They're coming up with chemotherapy that's, that's more specific, that it only attacks cancer cells and doesn't attack other cells. One of the case studies we're going to do later on when we get to the skin is going to introduce you to one of those chemotherapy types. Immunotherapy. Some people ask, you know, if a cancer cell is different than a body cell, here we have a bad cancer cell, okay, why doesn't your immune system attack it? And one thing they found is that the immune system, or cancer, kind of blocks the immune system from getting after it. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to find the parts or the cells of a person's immune system that would be the best at attacking a cancer. So there was a study done, or I'll give you an example of a case study. A man had a terminal skin cancer. They were pretty much giving him no more than two to three months to live. He went to this organization, or this it's called the Hutchinson Center in Seattle, and what they did is they took out cells of his immune system and they found the ones that were most likely to attack his cancer and they cloned them. So what they did is they made millions and millions of these cells that would attack his cancer. They put those cells back in his body and they pretty much destroyed all his skin cancer cells. So here was a man that was given two to three months to live and it's been about six years and he's been in remission ever since. So if we can get, if researchers can get your own immune system to attack, to see the cancer as being foreign and attack it, that's a real positive treatment. Again, we're seeing a lot, of, um, a lot of new treatments using your own immune system. The advantage to this is that you alleviate a lot of the side effects that you see in chemotherapy and radiation treatment. I do want to mention one thing, um, and you'll see this with people. Sometimes people have to make the, the decision on whether it's worth it or not to go through chemotherapy. Um, a friend of mine, her uncle, was diagnosed about three or four months ago with lung cancer. He's 83. The lung cancer had spread all throughout his body before they found it. It was in his lungs. It was also in his bones. And he had some in his brain. And they recommended, they wanted him to do some chemotherapy and they told him that the chemotherapy at best would give him maybe an extra year of life. He did the chemotherapy for about three or four weeks. And he was just so sick and it made him so miserable that he made the choice to come off it. The cancer was going to kill him. It was just a matter of when it, he was going to die from it. So he made the decision that he'd rather live the last month or two of his life not being as sick as the chemotherapy caused him to be. So you're going to see people have to make those decisions. It's not always an easy one, but most people, when they choose to come off the chemotherapy, um, they do it because they realize that their cancer is terminal, and they also realize and they've lived through what the chemotherapy can do to their body. So these are just some examples of the treatments for cancer that exist. Um, we'll do a few case studies with cancer so you understand it a little better. I'm going to have you watch another video that's a pretty neat video about a woman, um, Henrietta Lacks, who a lot of the cancer treatments from today are actually due to her ability of her cells, her cancer cells, to continually grow for at least over 50 or 60 years. So we'll talk about her also.